the old neighborhood. If you're driving to Parkland from downtown, your best bet is to take the Dan Ryan Expressway, I-57, which cleaves like a wide river with a bend here My name is Eric Charles May, the author of Bedrock Faith, the 2021 One Book, One Chicago selection by the Chicago Public Library. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. We are thrilled to welcome Professor John N. Lau to the CPL virtual stage this evening. Tonight's event, as you just heard, is part of the 2021 One Book, One Chicago season, exploring the theme, Neighborhoods, Our City's Bedrock, and the book Bedrock Faith by Eric Charles May. Please visit onebookonechicago.org for other upcoming programs, reading recommendations, on-demand video content, and more coming now through the end of the year. Tonight's program is possible and One Book, One Chicago is generously funded by donations to the Chicago Public Library Foundation. Visit cplffoundation.org for more information on how you can get involved with their work. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by CPL's Native American Heritage Committee, and I want to thank them for their special support in making tonight's program possible. During the program, we'll be monitoring the chat for questions from the audience for our Q&A following the talk, so please feel free to ask one. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor John N. Lau, author of the new book, Imprints, The Pokagon ba Band of Potawatomi Indians and the City of Chicago. Dr. Lau is a citizen of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi, Potawatomi and an associate professor at The Ohio State University, where he also serves as director of the Newark Earthworks Center. He grew up in Southwest Michigan, and lived for over 15 years in Chicago. He is currently involved in projects with the Field Museum of Natural History, the City of Chicago, the Chicago History Museum, and the MacArthur Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lau to the CPL virtual stage. Welcome, John. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, it's my honor to be here. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us uh, tonight. Um, and uh, so, uh, it's my uh, extreme pleasure to get to speak with you and share with you a book I uh, recently authored, uh, Imprints, uh, available through Michigan State University Press. So uh, I'm plugging the book, not just because it's a great resource about uh, native Chicago, but also I do get 10 cents for every copy sold. So, uh, uh, the cover of the book uh, represents, uh, you know, there's a turtle there. Uh, I'm Turtle Clan, so that was an obvious choice. Uh, represents uh, sort of, you can see the outline of the Great Lakes on the back of the turtle. It uh, goes back to our uh, creation stories where we are living on the back of the turtle. And uh, it's also that uh, white with the stripes is meant to uh, represent uh, birch bark or wigwas, as we say in Potawatomi. And that's referential to uh, birch bark booklets that Simon Pokagan, who I'll speak, speak about in a minute, he authored some birch bark booklets that he distributed at the 1893 Columbian uh, Exposition. So 
I'll go ahead and start this little PowerPoint. So, uh, and I'll move through these uh, somewhat quickly, uh, but I uh, wanted to articulate that, uh, you know, there's, the book is a series of stories uh, that uh, Chicago is ancestral Potawatomi lands, and that each chapter then uh, explains since uh, the uh, coming of settler colonists and since the removal of the Potawatomi from the area in 1838, uh, that uh, the Potawatomi have nonetheless, uh, although we were sp scattered across the country, up into Canada, down into Mexico also, that the uh, Potawatomi, specifically the Pokagon Potawatomi, have continued to play an important role in uh, Chicago's uh, life and in the story of what is Chicago. And so that's what I get to share with you uh, tonight. The impetus, motivation for me to write the book was uh, to capture the stories uh, that uh, many of these stories I grew up with, but uh, I wanted to make sure that other people had these stories that they weren't lost. And so I wanted to share these with both Native and non-Native peoples. Uh, so they would understand uh, the importance of Chicago, not only to Potawatomi people, but to people who live here and visited here, who think about here, right? So we talk about early history, we talk about Simon Pokagan, we talk about uh, land claims to the Chicago lakefront, we talk about uh, the Chicago American Indian Center's Canoe Club, and we finish up with a uh, battle over uh, Fort Dearborn Park. So with your permission, I'll keep moving along, which of course I have your permission. So there's a lot of tribes of the Great Lakes. I don't want to mislead and make uh, anyone think that uh, the Potawatomi were the only people in the Great Lakes. There were a lot of different people in the Great Lakes region and in Northern Illinois, but Primarily uh, Chicago, at the bottom of Lake Michigan, is uh, ancestral Potawatomi land. Uh, and we had lots of neighbors who we interacted with, who we intermarried with, who we exchanged ideas and things with, who we worked with. But again, uh, the uh, territory of the uh, Potawatomi ancestral lands extend from Door County up in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. uh, down uh, the uh, left side, the west side of Lake Michigan, around Chicago, uh, along the what's now the Indiana State, the Indiana Michigan state lines, and actually down into uh, the Maumee River Valley of Ohio. So at one time we were a very uh, powerful uh, tribe of uh, peoples and sorry, got a cat here. <laughs> uh, the red dots represent uh, Potawatomi villages. So you can see that uh, we're quite numerous. Um, and uh, Chicago, the dog uh, neck refers to um, uh, wild onions or wild leeks. And uh, even more specifically, uh, the villages uh, in and around Chicago that were all Potawatomi. Gete Bodwadme Odan, old Potawatomi villages. So uh, the first person I uh, talk about uh, specifically in the book is Kitty Hawa who I consider the first lady of Chicago. She was the uh, wife of John Baptiste uh, Point de Sable, uh, the first non-native resident, the founder, if you will, of contemporary Chicago, but Chicago had existed for thousands of years before non-natives came here. It was an obvious place with uh, location at the bottom of the lake with the uh, many rivers, the waterways uh, being the prominent uh, means of transportation, 
Chicago is also at a north-south continental divide, so we could go north, go south, depending on which uh, waterway we took. We could travel the Great Lakes up the St. Lawrence River all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. We could travel up the Hudson Bay. We could uh, take the uh, uh, Des Plaines uh, River portage, uh, Chicago to Des Plaines River, and on down to the uh, uh, Mississippi. And from there, we could reach uh, uh, Minnesota to the north. We could reach the Missouri River, travel to Yellowstone. We could uh, take uh, the Ohio River east up to Pittsburgh, towards south and down to the Gulf of Mexico. So, uh, and not just Potawatomi, we're using these as highways, right? Um, I have students on occasion that say, well, Indians couldn't have been too sophisticated. They didn't invent the wheel. And I usually respond with, well, Europeans couldn't have been too sophisticated. They didn't invent the canoe. So, um, uh, it uh, just is a uh, means of travel, right? So, canoes at Chicago. Uh, 1833 Treaty of Chicago. Uh, the last uh, land session treaty in Illinois, that's Leopold Polkagen, the patriarch of my tribe at that time. The United States government started calling us Polkagen's Band or Polkagen's Tribe, so we sort of we embraced the name. Uh, he negotiated an exception for us to stay in southwest Michigan and northwest Indiana because we had converted to Christianity. And so uh, other Potawatomi fled north to northern Wisconsin or to Canada. Some fled very far south to Mexico with the Kickapoo. Uh, some stayed and uh, were uh, swept up in Indian removals. His uh, son, Simon Pokagan, was um, uh, a celebrity in his own time. I mentioned before uh, the Birch Bark Booklets. Uh, this is his Red Band's greeting uh, that uh, he uh, sold on the Midway um, at the Columbian Exposition. And in it, he lamented the fact that uh, at the Columbian Exposition, they had provided no platform uh, for uh, the uh, Native peoples of the area to be included. And, and he was uh, reminding uh, the uh, folks that were at the uh, exposition that uh, while this is intended to be a celebration of the birth of a new nation, uh, we uh, as Indian peoples weren't able to celebrate uh, with so much joy because we had sacrificed so much and despite the fact that our sacrifices weren't being recognized. Uh, as a result of that, he was invited to speak uh, at the Columbian Exposition and did so on the uh, main stage there. He's to the far right and uh, spoke before 70,000 people at the Columbian Exposition. So uh, he was the author of second a novel ever written by a Native person in the Western style, uh, Ogamakwe Mitigwaki, uh, Queen of the Woods. And this, this is the frontispiece, the cover. Uh, this is an advertisement for the book. And I included this slide because you know, there's underneath uh, uh, in handwriting, uh, Chautauqua, New York, 1895. Apparently somebody Whoever had this uh, advertisement, it, you know, Simon was a uh, great orator, great writer, or good writer, great orator, um, and was speaking at the Chautauquas uh, because they'd seen him apparently in 1895. Um, I move on in the book uh, to uh, claims uh, for the Chicago Lakefront. Uh, the Potawatomi were not the only ones who made a claim to the Chicago Lakefront. Some of you may uh, have heard of George Wellington Streeter. 
Uh, he has a neighborhood named after him, Streeterville. And essentially what the claims were about was uh, the lakefront. The lakefront of Chicago had been extended east into Lake Michigan after the 1871 Great Fire of Chicago. Uh, all the debris, the refuge, the stuff, the junk, whatever, timbers, bricks, stone, whatever that, that couldn't be salvaged was dumped into the lake. The difficulty with that is that the lake, uh, so the lake ran along Michigan uh, Avenue originally, and that's why the pumping station so, uh, that we're all familiar with is on Michigan Avenue. That was the shoreline. All of that east of that, um, the Gold Coast, Streeterville, Newberry Library, Northwestern uh, Hospital, Med School, Law School, uh, Lincoln Park, Grant Park, Jackson Park, all of that was created by Phil. The difficulty is that the treaty, the land session treaties, Potawatomi had never given up the lake bed. They'd never ceded the lake. Other tribes in other instances on other occasions did cede lakes, did cede, give up, transfer the United States lake beds. We did not. We did not give up that territory. And the treaties used the shoreline of 1833 as the boundary. So if you fill it in, if you put fill on top of our lake bed, the claim is, or the idea is that you've, uh, you've just uh, enhanced uh, or changed our uh, lake bed into dry land, but we still own it and we've never been compensated for it. George Streeter took a different idea. He was uh, similar in some ways to the Potawatomi in that he agreed that this was new land. This was not a part of Illinois, but in an ironic twist, he came on his boat, boat the Rutan, and uh, I discuss this in the book. He planted a flag on, uh, again, this area that was pretty desolate, you know, um, planted the flag and declared by right of discovery that this was now the district of Lake Michigan and that he was the governor. He even uh, sent himself to Congress uh, and tried to be uh, seated as a congressman for this new district of Lake Michigan. Of course, the Potawatomi agreed that this was not a part of Illinois, but of course we argued Michael Williams, our uh, tribal secretary, um, and the Okagan Potawatomi sued for the Chicago Lakefront because we considered it still Indian land, land that had never been given up. So if you Google Williams v. Chicago, you'll find information about a lawsuit that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. So when we have movements about hashtag land back now, uh, it's kind of fun to remember that this is not a new thing, right? And my elders a hundred years ago were hashtag land back, right? We wanted our land back. Land to us is sacred. We have a familial family relationship with it. Nook Muskegonon, Grandmother Earth. Um, and we don't believe that it should be sold. We don't believe that it should be owned, but if it's anybody's territory, it's certainly our territory to be caretakers and custodians of. So uh, there was a lot of press about this. Most of it was rather, uh, of the times, rather racist. You know, Potawatomi the squat, invasion uh, coming to the lakefront, that sort of thing. But it was uh, uh, national news. Um, 1903, Simon's son, Charles Pokagan, even camped in Lincoln Park, led an annual encampment there for several years where we would stay to solidify and assert our claim to the Chicago Lakefront. And it became quite a tourist attraction, as you can see with the crowds of people all around. 
Um, the soup was initiated in 1914. Uh, we secured the services of attorney J.G. Grossberg, uh, and so he filed on our behalf. And again, uh, we didn't. We weren't successful. We were suing the city of the, a bunch of Indians, impoverished Indians. We're suing the city of Chicago, the Illinois Central Railroad, uh, the steel mills, uh, the park district, and any other entity that is uh, in that uh, built up lakefront. So. These were uh, the people who decided, and they decided that we had abandoned our claim to the lakefront. How we were supposed to not abandon it, Attorney Grossberg said, I don't understand how you abandon a lakefront. Were, were they to keep canoes in the water? But we have to remember the Supreme Court's made uh, bad decisions in the past. Probably will continue to do so in the future. They, uh, a U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that slavery was constitutional, has ruled that segregation was legal, has ruled that women had no constitutional right to the vote. Uh, no, and but they've been overturned by subsequent Supreme Courts, and so perhaps someday, um, although this is not a legal brief or a legal argument that I'm making, I'm just stating the facts, but it'd be nice if someday, uh, at least an, an acknowledgement of our um, connection to Lakefront could be made. So um, I also uh, continue with the chapter about uh, Leroy we saw. Uh, he uh, was Pokagan Potawatomi uh, he uh, grew up in Southwest Michigan also, uh, and this is his family. And uh, he started the uh, Chicago Canoe Club, uh, and it had definitely a Potawatomi uh, uh, sensibility to it, but it was intertribal. A lot of uh, Native peoples had been uh, relocated to urban areas, including Chicago, in the 1950s under relocation. And so he wanted, you know, a social, family, healthy uh, activity for the community to be involved in. But he also wanted it to be an opportunity to have a public face, a positive public face. There's also the American Indian Movement going on in the Red Power Movement in the Chicago Indian Village. And so there were reasons to protest, and um, you know, those protests were powerful too. But the Chicago Canoe Club also became a very powerful and public face of uh, Indian Chicago. Then I also uh, talked about, uh, towards the end of the book, about uh, the Fort Dearborn Monument. Uh, this was uh, set up by George Pullman uh, outside of his mansion on the near south side of Chicago, representing Black Partridge, supposedly saving Mrs. Helms. And of course, it was called the Fort Dearborn Massacre, according to the statute. Um, in uh, 2016 or so, I think. Um, well, let me let me step back and say this uh, statue stayed. You know, the the south side, the near south side, lost its panache with the uh, rich as they moved north, and then Bronzeville expanded on the south. And so, uh, you know, uh, when the complexion of the neighborhood changed, when African Americans moved into the area, they may have moved the statue out because, you know, we shouldn't, you know, I guess the city was thinking, we shouldn't have fine art in that neighborhood. So it moved to the um, uh, uh, entrance of the uh, Chicago History Museum, it was there for a few years until a local native uh, uh, activist uh, in the 70s complained about it and it was put back into storage where it is right now. Um, I happened to be uh, 
forget how I found out, but I found out through, I think, if anyone remembers, there used to be a newspaper called the Chicago Reader, and I got a copy of that, I think, and uh, saw that uh, they were going to build a Fort Dearborn Park in this green space that wasn't big enough to build any more condos. Of course, the complexion of the neighborhood had changed once again to a very gentrified uh, upper uh, upper in- income area. And uh, But this green space was too small to build on, so they were going to create a park. And the developer was thinking of, uh, how about Fort Dearborn Massacre Park? And we'll put the statue back on that statue. Well, um, I, I reached out not thinking that uh, he would respond. But I said, well, you know, no, you know, the uh, statue misrepresents history. It wasn't a massacre. It was a battle. It was a conflict. Um, and uh, as Simon Pokagan had said 100 years earlier, Whenever the white people win in a conflict, it's a battle. Whenever the Indians win in a conflict, it's a massacre. And that seemed to be the case. So um, so I said, this is a wonderful opportunity. If we don't put up the statue and we rename the park more accurately, Fort Dearborn, Battle of Fort Dearborn Park, which uh, they did. <coughs> and I guess it was actually probably around 2009. This happened because this is uh, uh, Padawami Veterans uh, Group uh, at the park dedication. So, uh, and so the park continues. And uh, so, uh, more recently, we finally, even though we're the closest, <coughs> we're the closest federally recognized tribe to Chicago. And Chicago sits on ancestral Potawatomi lands. At the American Indian Center, in the, they used to have a uh, great hall when they were at the previous center. Uh, our flag was not there in the rafters, um, probably because nobody had ever connected the dots, right? Nobody. So uh, I invited uh, Potawatomi, including our chairperson at the time, uh, Matt Weesaw, and the, from the tribe in red there, uh, holding on to the flag in the center, to uh, at the uh, 2010 uh, powwow uh, with Joe Palacic, who was then a uh, chair of the uh, American Indian Center, director of the American Indian Center. And uh, so we presented a flag to the American Indian Center, the Pokegnik, Bodwadnik, uh, and uh, we did an honor dance for Leroy we saw. And it was a very proud moment for me. Uh, I was uh, very much moved. And of course, I wanted to include that uh, in the book, that opportunity. So um, I wanted to plug uh, this Saturday at noon at uh, Michigan Avenue and Roosevelt Road, an activist artist by the name of Jiang Li and a host of native and non-native peoples are uh, going to engage in a, uh, a bit of performance art. They're going to lay a line of red sand from uh, Michigan Avenue, on Michigan Avenue at Roosevelt Road up to Pioneer Court at the river, at Chicago River there, demarcating uh, the unceded Indian territory. And, you know, I don't represent the Pokagon Potawatomi government, of course. Uh, I have no authority to. It's just a personal opinion that uh, shared by many Native and non-Native people that a uh, part of Chicago is still on Indian land and still on unceded Indian land. And so uh, there's going to be a procession, and I would, it kicks off at noon, and I would welcome you. I invite you all to uh, join in if you want. And uh, so, um, Big Wayne, uh, thank you. So uh, that's my uh, uh, short synopsis of the book. <laughs> and I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. I'm going to escape from this.
and stop there. And perhaps we can uh, have a conversation about uh, this or anything else that uh, is on anyone's mind. Thank you so much, John. We do have a couple of uh, questions that have come in from the chats and uh, emails, so I'll, uh, I'll get through as many as I can. Um, the first one is, what inspired you to write this book? Was it always something that you wanted to do uh, since you are a member of the tribe? Well, okay, so I'll, um, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll put my cards on the table. Um, I was uh, a graduate student looking for uh, something to write a dissertation about at the University of Michigan. And uh, I was at a conference where there were uh, uh, publishers, you know, generally come to these conferences and sell books and engage people, potential authors. So I met somebody uh, who was from the Michigan State Press, and I was still thinking about different things, something about canoes, thinking about birch bark or black ash, or, you know, I love materiality. I love representation and image and power. Um, and so I asked, you know, so the publisher uh, who I ended up working with on the book uh, asked me, well, usually you pick something that you know about, you know, what do you know about? Okay, well, I know about the Pukeng and Potawatomi really well, and probably better than anybody else that could write a book about them, because I was born in the community, and everybody knows me. They know my mom, they know my grandma, they know my great-grandma, you know, there's no surprises, you know, so I can write about that. And then she said, well, you know, that's good, but, you know, urban Indians are really a hot topic right now. Can you make a connection between the two? And like the light bulbs went off. I, it was like, can I make a connection between the two? Of course I can. To Chicago, and Pokeg and Potawatomi have always been connected to the city of Chicago, past, present, and future. And she said, turn that into a book. Turn that into a dissertation, then come see me. And uh, so uh, it uh, worked out very well. And uh, so, but I also, really wanted to write uh, something, as I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, acknowledged this land, uh, that um, acknowledged who we are as Native and non-Native people living on this land, uh, to preserve these stories for both Native and non-Native peoples who had an interest in you know, my favorite city in the world, right, Chicago. Um, and uh, so uh, it all flowed uh, pretty well. Great. Um, another person asks, growing up in Chicago, we did not learn anything about this history. What books, films, et cetera, do you recommend if we want to learn more? Should we be teaching this in the schools? Sure. Um, well, uh, uh, Dave Beck and his... Uh, a wife, Rosalind Lapeer, have written a couple of books. Um, one of them, the most recent one, is City Indians. It talks about Indians in Chicago, um, not focused on the Potawatomi. And uh, so uh, I would definitely recommend that. Uh, there was uh, um, uh, I think it was Legrand. Uh, trying to remember, uh, 19, LeGrand. who? LeGrand. James. Le, James Legrand wrote a book that's uh, pretty good about Chicago. Uh, uh, a professor that I had at U of Chicago, uh, uh, Terry Strauss, S T R A U S, edited three volumes of what she called Essays on Chicago by Native, mm -hmm. primarily Native, but not all Native authors. They're all titled like Native Chicago 1, Native Chicago 2, and Native Chicago 3. Uh, and they're not easy to find, but you can usually get them through a library. So I would recommend them. Uh, the films about Chicago, um, yeah, that still needs to be done, a good film about uh, in Chicago. And of course, if you're looking for, um, I'll plug my book, 
uh, if you're interested in uh, events that include Chicago and include Potawatomi peoples, you know, I think my book's a pretty good resource. And of course, I have to remind folks that it is available at your local Chicago Public Library branch, so you can always go check that out as well. Yeah. Uh, we have another person that mentioned um, your you mentioned that the land is considered unseated. What is the status or likelihood of any additional lawsuits in your opinion? Um, well, I do have a law degree too, I should mention. So, you know, the legal stuff interests me as a tribal attorney, I practice law also. So it's fun to think about, uh, but with the current Supreme Court, uh, you never want to file a case. It's going to be a loose, losing case. It's better to wait. Uh, so, uh, you know, that that would be my thought is that uh, we have to bide our time. And whether or not, you know, I don't think that uh, the point now is to, maybe a hundred years ago, the point was to get compensation because we were very poor people. And if we'd gotten some compensation, you know, I grew up with uh, elders that lived in houses with dirt floors and no running water. And so you know, those were very difficult times. I'm sure a hundred years ago was even worse. Um, we're not, we're financially pretty healthy, frankly, now, you know, economic development um, for casinos, for win casinos. I will remind everyone that every day is a lucky day. At Four Winds Casino in New Buffalo, it's only uh, 70 miles away, exit one. Uh, but uh, so it's, I think it's more of a uh, moral and ethical responsibility. And I think certainly, you know, the Chicago Public Libraries is doing a great uh, uh, action step, right, of acknowledging whose land. Chicago is on by providing forums and space for native peoples to speak and like me, but other people too, so that we can have a forum so we can get to know you and you can get to know us. So the likelihood, I should mention though, that Northerly Island was not covered by the lawsuit because it was built in 1933 for the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. And later for some of us remember it as Meg's Field. But now, you know, younger people think of it is a concert venue in, in Wild Flower Garden. Um, that's not covered by the law, the Supreme Court decision, because it didn't exist. Uh, so I would love to see um, a place where, you know, what if uh, we were granted, you know, some kind of shared uh, uh, custodianship with perhaps other residents of the city of Chicago, contemporary native residents of Chicago, but also Potawatomi peoples. We could grow corn, grow some wild rice, have a museum, have a uh, you know a, a place for uh, speakers, um, whatever else, whatever you know, uh, any development committee to said, but a place, a native Chicago, an Indian Chicago on Northerly Island, and I think that that would be. In my mind, very fair, but I'm, I come from a certain perspective. I think that would be cool. <laughs> um, that yeah. actually leads into the next question that we got um, from someone who asks, I have noticed that sometimes in museums, the presentation of Native Americans can be sometimes problematic or outdated. Are there any local museums you think are doing a good job since you mentioned you work with different museums? Sure. Well. Uh, the Field Museum, I'm happy to say, you know, they've been working on the uh, American Indian Gallery for maybe 15 years or more. Anyway, it's going to open next year completely remodeled with, uh, I don't know what it's going to look like, but it can't be any worse than the last one. <laughs> and, uh, but I know that they have a lot of native collaborations and input and voice and partnership. And so I suspect that the Field Museum next year will be a really good, um, really good uh, place to go. I will mention also, I do have a black ash basket exhibit going on at the Field Museum right now on the second floor. 
interestingly enough, in the Pacific Island Oceania section. But across from the Maori house, which is a living entity, you can see the black ash Potawatomi baskets, which are also living entities. And so uh, I invite you all to, that's open through February. And lastly, uh, the MacArthur Foundation, uh, they of course are headquartered in the Marquette building. And uh, they invited us and uh, Andrea Carlson, who is an artist who put up that you are on Potawatomi land banner on Wacker Drive. Um, uh, she is co-curating with me an exhibit that is basically an intervention of the lobby of the Marquette Bill, or the, yeah, the entrance, the lobby, you know, with all the Tiffany glass and the bronze bar reliefs and, you know, the celebration of white civilization to, you know, the savage woods. You know, we're doing, in the lobby following that, the arcade, we're doing an exhibit. And it's ending up that, and this is a, a lesson that I will share with everyone is if you make it so expensive, which this is turning out to be, they went from, you know, this will be a couple of year exhibit to now they're thinking of at least 10 years exhibit because it's so expensive. So uh, so if you do it, do it big, and then they can't afford to get rid of it. But that'll be a good opportunity to see about uh, Potawatomi in Chicago too. Uh, and that's open and free um, someday when the pandemic's over. That's fascinating. Um, Santa asks, I'm a writer looking for research sources on Jean-Baptiste Dussable's Potawatomi wife, Kitty Hawa. Uh, any suggestions? Um, I get asked that a lot. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it, uh, throughout history around the world, um, the history is either being uh, jotted down by uh, white male missionaries or white male historians. And uh, so we have very little, uh, we have a little more information about Archange Wilmette, who married the traitor. Uh, we have a little more information about Watsika, who married the traitor Hubbard. She lived near Kankakee. Uh, but we have very little written about Kirihawa. I've actually even been told by our uh, language instructor Pokagon Potawatomi that Kirihawa is not a Potawatomi name. So it's gotten, we, so we don't even know what her name was, but it apparently sounded like Kirihawa to somebody at some point. But yeah, it's, uh, I would ask that person that if they are find any uh, primary source materials about Kirihawa, to email me at low89 at osu.edu. Uh, I would love to uh, be able to uh, share that information or even read whatever they, you know, whatever they find or write to produce with it. That's great. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, in the last year or two years, we have seen many social justice movements gain more attention. Can you talk about the intersection of Black Lives Matter, women's movement, et cetera, with Native Americans? Um, sure. Um, well, in the past, you know, in my lifetime, because I'm an elder now, so I can talk about the, you know, the old days. Um, you know, it was the Red Power Movement, uh, the American Indian Movement, really emerged during the time of the Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Rights Movement, the Gay Rights Movement, the Migrant uh, Farm Workers Movement, the Anti-War Movement. You know, change was in the air. And so that was a time when uh, Native people started uh, organizing and um, uh, activism. Uh, the same thing, I think, is going on now is that changes in the air. And so um, uh, there has been um, uh, you know, um, efforts to um, that go everywhere from, uh, you know, Chicago's involved in, you know, re-examining of all of their statues, for instance, many of them, American Indian statues that either misrepresent or denigrate or dismiss uh, Indian peoples. And that's actually a Chicago Monuments project that I'm a part of. And so um, that's, uh, 
that's something that um, is going on. I know that uh, there's a lot of um, uh, collaborations across the country between all between groups that it's understood, you know, that should be protesting or protesting, and they're protesting uh, uh, in uh, in activism for issues that are important to them. And so, uh, uh, the Native people I know fully support uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, and fully support the uh, rights of uh, gay and transgender people, support the rights of women, brown people, uh, undocumented people. You know that. Um, you know, um, we all, we're all, Indians are only 1.5% of the population. The only way we ever get any movement on anything in a positive way is if we develop alliances, allies. And so we're always looking for allies, uh, non-native people that will join with us. And, uh, uh, and we can all fight uh, for um, justice uh, as common cause. Well, I think that's a great note to, to end on. We'll just ask you, what do you think are some good ways that people can be allies? Uh, Saturday would be a good uh, opportunity to be an ally, is to uh, join the group that's going to lay down uh, the uh, draw a line in the sand, if you will. Um, and uh, uh, other ways is to uh, uh, connect with the uh, Chicago American Indian Center if you're uh, in this Chicago, greater Chicago area, um, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, go, uh, go out into Native communities and visit the Pokagon Potawatomi. You know, we're in Southwest Michigan and we're not hard to find. We don't hide. Um, come out and visit us. Uh, we have a, a history and culture department that uh, people would be glad to uh, meet with you. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, it's uh, there's lots of opportunities. Uh, just interaction would be, uh, you know, that's where understanding can begin. That's and great. trust. Well, thank you, John. That is all the time we have for tonight. But we just want to thank you for a wonderful conversation and for being here. I want to thank again uh, the CPL Native American Heritage Committee for their support in making tonight's event happen. Thanks to CPL Tech's Leland Mosley for producing tonight's event, and thanks to all of you for being here. If you enjoyed tonight's program, I want to mention a couple of things. Of course, again, we want to plug that this Saturday, October 2nd at noon, you can witness the Who's Lakefront procession, which kicks off at the corner of Michigan Avenue and Roosevelt Road and goes north. There's more information at whoslakefront.com. That's whoslakefront.com, and also on CPL's uh, website, you can find some more information. Also, be sure to mark your calendars for Monday, October 25th at 6 p.m. when CPL will present a panel discussion on the Who's Lakefront Project, uh, Chicago's unceded native land, with panelists including Ji Yoon Lee, Madeline Wiesaw, Deborah Yappa Papan, and John will be back again. So we look forward to seeing you again, John. And finally, don't forget, check out John's book at your local library branch. Please visit onebookonechicago.org for information on other upcoming events around our theme, neighborhoods, our city's bedrock, including book discussions, films, author events, art programs, and more. Also visit the CPL YouTube and Facebook pages for on-demand video content, including from tonight's program. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Jennifer.